Thank you for joining us. Here's what's coming up on The World Today. Deal to allow Ukraine resume exports of grain signed in Istanbul. Mali jihadists blame for attack on main army base. Plus, military raid Sri Lanka protest camps, leaders arrested. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Melissa Antwonwaka. We begin with Russia's invasion of Ukraine, but there's some good news. Hailed as a first step to solving the global food crisis, Russia and Ukrainian officials have signed a deal in Istanbul which will free up grain exports from black seaports. The neighboring warring countries are among the world's biggest exporters of food, but Russia's invasion led to a de facto blockade of the Black Sea, resulting in Ukraine's exports dropping to a sixth of their pre-war level. Russian Defense Minister Sergei Shogu and Ukraine's Infrastructure Minister Oleksandr Kubarakov were the signatories. The signing ceremony took place at Istanbul's lavish Domobak Palace in the presence of Turkish President Recep Tayyip Erdogan and UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres. The agreement is valid for 120 days, long enough to clear a backlog of up to 25 million tons of wheat and other grain stuck in Ukrainian ports. Speaking on the deal, UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres described it as an agreement for the world. Let there be no doubt, this is an agreement for the world. It will bring relief for developing countries on the edge of bankruptcy and the most vulnerable people on the edge of famine. We just signed open the pass for significant volumes of commercial food exports from three key U Ukrainian ports in the Black Sea, Odessa, Chebonorsk, and Yuzhny. The shipment of grain and food stocks into world markets will help bridge the global food supply gap and reduce pressure on high prices. The commitment and dedication are even more vital today. This initiative must be fully implemented because the world so desperately needs it to tackle the global food crisis. We count on the government of Turkey to maintain its critical role going forward. And I am here to pledge the full commitment of the United Nations. And to the situation on ground, Russia has continued its strikes on Ukrainian military targets, according to the information released by Igor Konashenkov, Russia's defense ministry spokesman, while Ukraine says that it has blocked Russia military operations. According to Konashenkov, Russian forces struck multiple Ukrainian military command posts located in cities of Nikolaev, Kramatorsk destroyed several ammunition depots of Ukraine in Donetsk, Nikolaev, and shot down several fighter jets of Ukrainian air forces. Ukraine state's new agency reported Thursday, citing the information released by Ukrainian military department, that the Russian military has been continuing its large-scale shelling in Sumy, Kharkiv, Luhansk and Donetsk, while Russian forces failed to make a breakthrough in the direction of Bakhmut and also failed to capture the Ugoskovsk power plant. Some Western countries have been continuing to increase military support to Ukraine. Well, to talk more about this good news and all that's happening with the Russia's invasion of Ukraine, joining us right now is Mr. John Essing. He's a lawyer and anti-terrorism expert. He joins us virtually from London. Thank you for joining us on the program. Thank you for having me, Melissa. Good evening. Good evening. Just before we delve into the highlights um, of this week with Russia's invasion of Ukraine, breaking today is what the UN Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, has called um, a beacon of hope that would help ease the global food crisis. Were you surprised that both countries would come to uh, sort of this agreement? I, I was absolutely surprised. I didn't see that coming. I don't think many people did. But I think it had something to do with the uh, with the tri uh, tripartite agreement that was just some of the agreements that was just reached in were reached in um, in Iran because I know that. Um, uh, Saad Erdogan has been the one, uh, the main uh, 
uh, uh, uh, nation, uh, uh, president of uh, Turkey, negotiating for for a corridor out of the Black Sea to to transfer the grains out. Uh, he went to to Iran uh, with uh, with Vladimir Putin, but he didn't get anything out of that uh, uh, alliance, even though it was an alliance. Iran got what it wanted. Russia got what it wanted. He, uh, you know, but he was left with nothing. Uh, so I think that was, in a way, just to appease him because he wanted to. He wanted a, a footprint in in northern Syria, to to. Uh, to try and uh, fend off the the dissident uh, PKK that he considers a terrorist group that has been has been at war with uh, with Turkey for for some years now, but they turned him down. So I think this was just a gesture. So just so it doesn't look like he left there without anything. I think the most strategic, the other reason I think uh, is uh, that because he's looking for alliances now. He's been isolated by the West. He's looking for alliances elsewhere, which is why he went to he went to Iraq. And he has operational footprints for defense and security across across Africa, especially the Sahel. And uh, some African uh, uh, countries had warned him that they were the most affected by by the by what was happening in in Ukraine by him holding up the grain, the grain. So I think that was uh, part of. Uh, I think it's a strategic move because eventually he has to form those alliances. He has to form. So strategic alliances across across Africa, on the basis of what he's lost. So I think for those main two reasons, uh, th- that's why we got the surprise we got today. I didn't see it coming. And you're also looking at other benefits for Russia, and that's also its fertilizers, which aren't under sanctions. But it also means exports of grain from Ukraine, vital uh, for war- the war-torn nation. And, of course, many in the developing world who are at risk of famine uh, will heave a sigh of relief. We understand that commodity prices have dropped after this announcement. But another thing here Absolutely. is the effect of or perhaps the role that Turkey is, is playing and has played. And you know, perhaps the future in terms of a solution to this crisis that Turkey can play um, in negotiating peace between Russia and Ukraine? Uh, it, it depends on what the peace will, will look like. Ukraine does not want to cede any of its, any of its uh, territory to Russia to, for, for any form of negotiations. That was the position from on the 14th of February, on the 24th of February, sorry, and it hasn't changed. And it wouldn't change because Russia is running out of, out of ideas in, in Ukraine. It's, it's despite the propaganda, it's, it's suffering uh, 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 by the hands of the Ukra- Ukrainians. I think the last time we spoke, I recall saying that they're waiting for weapons to come for heavy, for uh, 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 long range weapons to come from the US when they were still in Soviet Donetsk. But those weapons didn't turn up. And so they were driven into the Shisans. And eventually driven all out of uh, Luhansk uh, or blast uh, one fifty uh, percent uh, of the Donbass completely. But now that the Russians have dug in uh, 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 and they are preparing to take the rest of uh, Donetsk, uh, um, I think it's going to have a difficult time because those weapons have eventually turned up. They have the HIMARS now. They have the MLRSs. Uh, uh, they have some heavy artillery as well and a lot of shells. And uh, Russia, on the on their part, have been using up approximately 30,000 shells, artillery shells, a, a day. That amounts to a lot. And when you have uh, 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 um, a sanctions regime that includes not being so any anything connected to defense in the defense industry, defense or, or security, then you have a problem because a lot of what they use to manufacture those some of their equipment are Western anyway. So if they lose a, t- a tank, for instance, uh, on a, on a, based on a, 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 a mechanical fault, it can be repaired. That's the end of it. And, and, and they've lost a lot of personnel as well. So, uh, and I, I was going to say that you know, looking at the level of bombardment, um, and so far Russia secured Luhansk, almost all of Donetsk, the industrialized parts of Ukraine, has seen the biggest battle uh, in Europe. Um, should Ukraine still maintain that it won't see territories? Um, what hope is there uh, for Ukraine? Seeing as also um, after 
uh, Russia just two days ago, I believe, said that they were expanding, they were going beyond uh, what they had originally planned, seeing as Ukraine now has access to long-range weapons. I think it's all propaganda because Ukraine has been doing a lot with it, especially the high mass. Those high masses have a range of, I think, about 300, 300 kilometers. And they've been able to reach behind enemy lines, destroying command control uh, uh, posts, destroying uh, uh, ammunition depots, destroying uh, uh, air defense systems, uh, you know, and some other things. So it's re that has really impacted on, on Russia's uh, advances coming forward because they're they depending on those on those infrastructure to, to carry out the war effectively. We don't hear much about what Ukraine is doing, but Ukraine is doing a lot of damage to, to, to the Russians. And for Russia to win this war, it has to do two things. It has to stop Ukraine from, from being mobile, and it has to kill its spirit to fight. And they've not been able to do either. So uh, uh, as long as Ukraine is prepared to fight, as long as the weapons keep coming, uh, we do, there's no end to, you know, near end to this war. And the West have, have, uh, have recommitted themselves, you know, to really supporting Ukraine. Because I think that initially when this war started, I think the West was of the opinion that it, it, it's, 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 uh, it's optional for them, that it's an optional intervention. They don't really need to interfere if they, if they don't want to. But I think now they've come to the realization that the, the rules-based international order is really at stake here, it, it, you know. And if, uh, as it is now, if Ukraine fails, then the West fails, and they can't afford that because that will change the way we know life. Now it will completely change everything because that order will be substituted for the uh, uh, totalitarian, repressive uh, 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 policy priorities of of uh, revisionist. Like like Russia, like Iran, like uh, 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 North Korea and uh, and China, uh, it's it's closer to that. And, and finally, Mr. Essie, what ought to be NATO or the West response without the risk of triggering a nuclear war? Um, I think this was also recently the Belarusian president was saying uh, quite surprisingly that we must stop, reach an agreement, end this mess and operation in Ukraine. I think that that is a, a latent indicator to what Russia is suffering, and that that announcement came when uh, I think it came when uh, Vladimir Putin was in, in in Iran, and Iran was blaming the West as well for 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 NATO, for the West starting the war. Uh, I, th I think that, that that's not coincidental that uh, the. Uh, Alatoya Khomeini, I think that's what his name is, the, the, the supreme leader of Iran and uh, the, the Belarusian president tend to say the same thing, uh, you know, at about the same time. I think it indicates the pressure under which uh, Russia is at the moment, despite the propaganda. But what I think what the West is, is concerned about is doing too much, doing what they, they would view as too much that might trigger a nuclear war. I don't think there's, there's any chance of that because there are certain elements that would constitute uh, a threshold. And if NATO or the West cross that threshold, that is when there can be a war. They will either have to uh, target Russian forces in Ukraine or they'll have to deploy uh, uh, combat troops into Ukraine uh, against Russia with a, a NATO flag. And if none of that happens, then, the, the, you know, Russia cannot go to war with Ukraine under international law. I don't see NATO doing either of that. So as long as that does not happen, then I don't think there'll be a nuclear war. Because uh, uh, Ukraine is not a nuclear power anyway. It doesn't have any nuclear capabilities. You know, the, the only, the closest we came to having this, a situation like this was in 1962, I think it was when the CIA reported to J.F. Kennedy, who was the president of the U.S. at the time, that uh, Nikita Khrushchev, who was president of the former USSR, had sneaked some nukes into, into Cuba. And uh, when JFK found out, he told him to get the nukes out. They negotiated, eventually got them out in exchange for the U.S. getting their nukes out of uh, Turkey at the time. So uh, there's only one nation 
uh, 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 with nuclear weapons, and that's Russia. So I don't think this will. I, I don't think that will happen. Okay. Which is why the West needs to do more. They need to supply them with heavier weapons. They need to supply Ukraine with what what it needs. Especially now, they realize that a loss for Ukraine is a loss for the West. It's not just. It's not about Ukraine anymore. Like we, always to that. we always appreciate your time. Thank you so much for sharing your expertise with us. Mr. John Essing is a lawyer and anti-terrorism expert. Thanks again. Thank you for having me, Minister. Bye-bye. Ukrainian Navy sailors have been provided training by the British Royal Navy at an undisclosed location in Scotland. Ukraine's Deputy Defence Minister Volodymyr Havelov and British Armed Forces Minister James Happy watched over the training. British Defence Secretary Ben Wallace says the government will send scores of artillery guns and more than 1,600 anti-tank weapons to Ukraine to help bolster the country's defence against Russia. The boost comes after British Prime Minister Boris Johnson last month promised another £1 billion of military support, bringing total UK support to Ukraine since the start of the war, which Russia calls a special operation, to £2.3 billion. Expecting to get two minesweepers, and we really need them to support Ukrainian efforts in the Black Sea to, for the mining. It's also a, a part of the humanitarian mission, uh, which is very important to the world. Self-defense of the ships, and also, most importantly, these are specialist mine countermeasure vessels, so to be able to discover and destroy uh, mines if they find them. And on gas supplies, German Chancellor Olaf Scholz has assured the German public that they will not be left alone to deal with the increased energy bills. She says he will never walk alone, referencing, or rather he said, referencing the fan song of the Liverpool Football Club, synonymous with showing support and solidarity during a news conference in Berlin. Mr Scholz announced earlier today that the country would... Um, rather avert the collapse of gas importer in turn starting this fall. Uh, Uniper will pass on higher gas prices to the consumers, leading to a possible 200 to 300 euro increase in the energy bill of an average family of four. He said, we overcome the difficult times together, that we stick together, that is crucial. No one is left alone with their challenges and problems, not one single citizen, not even the companies in this country, adding that together... They are strong enough to manage this. Well, still to come on the program. A congressional inquiry to former U.S. President Donald Trump ignored pleas to capital attack. Please stay with us. So the world today on channels television, an offshoot of Russia's invasion of Ukraine. The European Commission this week asked European Union member states to slash their gas consumption by 15% over the coming months to ensure that a complete cutoff of natural gas supplies from Russia will not fundamentally disrupt industries of the 27-nation bloc next winter. In a plan outlined Wednesday, the Commission proposed that the period of reduced gas consumption would last from August 1 to the end of March 2023. It has also asked for the part to impose mandatory reductions across the bloc if a union alert is announced when necessary. Several European governments, Spain, Portugal and Greece, voiced opposition on Thursday to EU plans to ration natural gas supplies in preparation for a shortfall. It comes as gas deliveries through the German-Russian pipeline Nord Stream 1 resumed yesterday morning after 10 days of maintenance. Deutsche Welle, uh, Stephen Beardsley joins me now for more. Hi, Steve. Uh, Russia turned gas deliveries back on. Uh, so what's the problem? That's true. Russia did turn back on gas deliveries for the single largest pipeline running to Europe. That is Nord Stream 1. But the crisis is far from over. Uh, the, the fear here is that, uh, or the problem, I should say, is that the flows are reduced right now. So they're actually at less than half of the gas pipeline capacity. And that's a problem for European nations that are racing right now to fill up their reserves ahead of winter, the period in which there is the highest demand for that gas. Now, there's also the knowledge that uh, Russia could uh, continue to further throttle back 
back supplies coming through the pipeline or that they could turn it off altogether abruptly. There's also the added challenge of the fact that reduced flows, um, they make it harder in some ways for nations to prepare for a complete cutoff because uh, critics can always point to the pipeline and say, look, it's still running. Why do we need to take uh, very strong uh, savings uh, measures right now? There is gas there, and uh, Russia says that if X, Y, and Z are done, then the flows will increase. Um, and so that's the kind of environment in which the EU is trying to prepare for these shortfalls right now. It's not easy. And Steve, where is the disagreement again between EU members on this? As in many topics that are difficult for the EU, it's about showing solidarity during problems that really affect one side of the bloc more than another. Now, interestingly, in this case, it's Germany that's really having the hardest time. More than any other nation, it's built its economy around cheap Russian natural gas. There are entire industries with large employee bases, with large downstream consumers that are heavily, heavily, if not completely reliant on cheap Russian natural gas. That includes households as well uh, for wintertime heating. So any sort of disruption, major disruption, would be significant for Germany. Now compare that to Spain. In Spain, there's much less exposure to Russian natural gas. There's also much more alternatives. Uh, the infrastructure for liquefied natural gas um, exists um, in Spain in a way that it does not in Germany. There are no terminals to accept liquefied natural gas and to regasify it in Germany. In Spain, there are multiple. Um, so that's that's a big difference right there. We also know that with Spain, there is a reluctance to pass down too much burdens down to consumers, down to the people. Uh, we saw that before the beginning of the war, actually, as gas prices shot up uh, from some market dynamics. We saw that Spain went ahead and intervened and that it capped gas prices that utilities could pass on to consumers. So that created a false uh, market signal for consumers. It allowed them to pay cheaper, artificially cheaper prices, and that doesn't encourage savings. So that is a concern as well going forward. Is that consumers aren't feeling a need to save and that Spain doesn't want to create those mechanisms for them to feel it. And solidarity is important for Europe and also the West uh, with this invasion, but how divisive could this issue be going ahead? Yeah, it's already taken a sharp tone. Um, the quote that made everyone's ears perk up yesterday came from the Spanish energy minister. She said in response to this plan to save 15 percent uh, of gas for every EU member nation to, to do that. She said, look, Spaniards, um, unlike in other countries, are not living beyond their means when it comes to energy. Now, she was referring to Germany, obviously, but she was also making a not so coded reference uh, to the kind of language that was used more than a decade ago for the euro crisis. That was when uh, countries like Italy, Portugal and Spain were in deep trouble uh, due to mounting debt, due to mounting deficits and lower revenues. Um, at that time, Germany and other countries um, who were considered the thrifty nations of the EU, they tended to lecture those nations and say, look, you've got to uh, you put yourself in this situation. You were living beyond your means and you, you need to straighten your books out. So it's very clear with that reference, we see how close to the surface old tensions lie. Um, and that will be a challenge. That said, it's always been noted that the EU tends to come together during crisis. It's often said that it's forged further. It's, it's, it's progressed. It's pushed forward during difficult crises. And this case with, with European gas will be uh, a crisis. It needs to see solidarity from EU members. Uh, you know, the final point I would make is that if Russia does turn off gas flows to Germany, for example, that's a major hub for the rest of Europe. The question there, will Germany continue to deliver uh, gas downstream, even if it's coming from its own reserves? That will be a test of solidarity. Will Austria, which contains the major gas reserve for the southern Germany, a southern German, highly industrialized area of Bavaria, will it deliver gas to that region if gas, uh, if new gas supplies are shut off in Russia? These are the questions that are going to really uh, be the test of Europe and its solidarity. We we'll continue to keep tabs on the developments. Many thanks, Deutsche Welle's Steven Bietzli from Berlin. There. Into all the stories, the Malian military says an attack on an army base just outside the capital Bamako was carried out by an Al-Qaeda-linked group. It says Katiba Machina used two cars packed with explosives to target the Kati camp, the army's main military base. The statement says seven assailants were killed and one soldier died. People living in the area reported hearing heavy gunfire for around an hour and saw helicopters circling above the base, which is just 15 kilometers, nine miles from Bamako. 
For more than a decade, Islamist militants have been carrying out frequent attacks in Mali, but it is extremely rare for the jihadists to hit targets so close to the capital. The violence comes as France is withdrawing its troops from the country after falling out with Mali's military leaders. Over in Sri Lanka, new president Ranil Wickremesinghe has sworn in his new cabinet ministers a day after he was elected as the eighth executive president of Sri Lanka amid the country's economic crisis. Wickremesinghe, a six-time prime minister, was sworn in as president Thursday after winning a parliamentary vote to succeed Gotabaya Rajapaksa, who fled to Singapore last week in the wake of massive public protests triggered by the country's worst economic crisis in seven decades. A senior lawmaker regarded as a Rajapaksa ally, Denis Gunawadena, was sworn in as the new prime minister. 17 other ministers completed the cabinet, with former finance minister Ali Sabri becoming foreign minister. As weak Remesinga lawmakers and officials listen to Guaradena being sworn in at the prime minister's office, uniformed military officers sat on one side of the room. Staying with Sri Lanka, its security forces have raided and partially cleared a protest camp occupying government grounds in Colombo early Friday, fueling fears that President Rick Ramasinghe had launched a crackdown a day after being sworn in. Media footage showed uh, soldiers in riot gear armed with assault rifles tearing down the camp set up in April by protesters enraged by the country's economic collapse and acute shortages of fuel, food and medicine. Earlier, police said nine people had been arrested following the raid on the protest camp. Police protesters said had feared a crackdown was imminent as Week Ramasinghe imposed a state of emergency in the country from Monday when he was the acting head of state and many regarded him as an ally of Rajapaksa. According to protest organizer Chamira Duwagi, they had planned to hand over the presidential secretariat to government authorities this afternoon. Police say they had no information on that. Over in the United States, a congressional inquiry has heard that former President Donald Trump watched last year's Capitol riots on TV at the White House, ignoring his children and aides who begged him to rebuke the mob. Adam Kassin Kinsinger, one of the two Republicans on the Democratic-led committee, says he chose not to act. The primetime hearing was told Mr. Trump did not make a single call to law enforcement or national security staff. It was motivated by his selfish desire to stay in power. The inquiry you swear alleged. or affirm under penalty of perjury that the testimony you are about to give is the truth. I read it and uh, was uh, quite disturbed by it. Uh, I, I was disturbed and worried to see that the president was attacking uh, Vice President Pence for doing his constitutional duty. So the tweet looked to me like the opposite of what what we really needed at that moment, which was a de-escalation. Uh, and uh, that's why I, I had said earlier that it looked like fuel being poured on the fire. So that was the moment that I decided uh, that I was going to resign, that that would be my, my last day at the White House. Uh, I, I simply didn't want to be associated with, uh, uh, with the events that were unfolding on the Capitol. Thank you. And Ms. Matthews, what was your reaction to the president's tweet about Vice President Pence? I, I remember thinking that um, this was going to be bad for him to tweet this because it was essentially him giving the green light to these uh, people, telling them that what they were doing at the steps of the Capitol and entering the Capitol was okay, that they were justified in their anger. and. He shouldn't have been doing that. He should have been telling these people to go home and to leave and to condemn the violence that we were seeing. And I'm someone who has worked with him. You know, I worked on the campaign, traveled all around the country, going to countless rallies with him. And I've seen the impact that his words have on his supporters. He, they truly latch on to every word and every tweet that he says. And so, I think that in that moment, for him to tweet out the message about Mike Pence, it was him pouring gasoline on the fire and making it much worse.
Meanwhile, according to new video shown by the House committee investigating the attack, Donald Trump refused to admit in a speech the day after the January 6 assault on the U.S. Capitol that the 2020 election was over and that he had lost. The previously unseen footage was broadcast during Thursday's July 21 hearing of the House of Representatives Select Committee investigating the January 6 attack. I begin by addressing the heinous attack yesterday. And to those who broke the law, you will pay. You do not represent our movement. You do not represent our country. And if you broke the law, I can't say that. I'm not gonna, you, I already said you will pay. The demonstrators who infiltrated the Capitol have defied the seat of dust. It's defiled, right? See, I can't see it very well. Okay, I'll, I'll do this. I'm going to do this. Let's go. But this election is now over. Congress has certified the results. I don't want to say the election's over. I just want to say Congress has certified the results without saying the election's over, okay? But Congress is certified. Now Congress is Yeah, over. right. Now Congress is I didn't say over, so let, let me see. Don't go to the paragraph before. Our Washington correspondent uh, Maria Baer joins us now for more on this. Hi, Maria. Speak to us about some of the major highlights from yesterday's hearing and the reactions it's been getting. Well, it was quite a late night um, yesterday as it relates to the actual hearings that occurred. The reactions are one, I think, of surprise in some areas, to be very honest. I think that many people were cons are concerned about um, some of what uh, the detail for Vice President Pence giving goodbye uh, calls to their family, thinking that their lives could be lost as a result of this. Um, and as the, the video you just showed, I think people were very um, taken back by the former president's response um, to the attack uh, on the Capitol and, and get, getting the real details and the actual firsthand accounts as to how he was responding both emotionally and verbally um, to his team as it relates to uh, what he was going to do and how he would, at some level, be able to calm uh, the crowds. Um, we had, for the first time in American history, an attack on the U.S. democracy. And, you know, seeing that the president was not outspoken in trying to uh, deter that event, I think, was very disheartening to many Americans. And clearly, uh, Congress is extremely uh, bothered by this and concerned about actually what happened. And so I think that we are going to begin to see further actions, and this hearing is going to definitely look like going to September. Uh, Maria, I'm sure that, you know, the former president also feels that, you know, perhaps he's been snitched upon and that fairly, um, you know, he was making those comments uh, pre-hearing and, you know, they probably weren't supposed to come out. Just imagine if uh, we played all the president's, uh, you know, um, speeches and, you know, the errors they made before, uh, the, the ones we all saw, how bad, you know, it would look like. But then, um, you know, how has he, and this is Donald Trump now, has he been reacting to the allegations? Former President Trump is still moving forward with what he believes is going to be a campaign for his presidency um, in the next election cycle. Uh, we know that we are in the middle of gubernatorial races, a lot of local races here in the United States. And so he is um, putting his candidates in place. Um, he's backing many Republican candidates. And I think his focus, again, is really being able to try to see what he can do and put in place for these midterm elections and then ultimately run for office. I think he believes he has a strong chance of being able uh, to win the election again. Members of the committee have suggested there might be enough evidence to charge um, uh, Mr. Trump, with such counts as obstructing an official proceeding of Congress, conspiracy to defraud the American people or witness tampering. At this stage, how likely is this to happen and what would be the process? What you're beginning to see is a reflection back on what happened with the Watergate. And we know Watergate has been part of the conversation since the beginning, but really looking exactly what occurred during that Nixon administration and doing some comparisons there. Um, we don't have much precedence um, of this type of uh, situations and, and these type of claims uh, previously, but that is one that, that they're going to be using to, as you mentioned, the defrauding and, and the various other allegations that are being brought forth. And so um, once we're able to clearly establish, which I think they're getting close uh, to being able to establish exactly what has occurred and what are some of the uh, 
uh, violations in, in some of the areas of law that he broke, uh, then we'll begin to see charges brought forth um, and being able to really identify. And, and if you look at what Congress is really looking to do is they're really making sure that this allows, if he has broken the law and if there is, um, if he's going to be charged with anything, that this happens before the next uh, presidential election cycle. So he can either not be allowed to run for office or at least um, providing American people enough information uh, that puts them in the best decision to make uh, the best choice for the U.S. And finally, quickly, also, uh, Maria, away from the Capitol hearings, uh, yesterday President Biden tested positive for COVID. Do we have any information on how he's doing today? Well, today they are saying that he's still doing well. He's in isolation um, and will be for at least five days. Um, but they are likely going to keep him in isolation until he has a negative COVID test um, result. Um, he is still doing work as usual, just not able to uh, be out with uh, his other colleagues. We're obviously not able to travel at this time. Uh, we do know that his wife is still uh, tested negative. Um, so there's no, at this point, any uh, potential risk with her. Um, and so we'll continue to probably see him working through this. He has a, a slight cough and a runny nose um, and a little fatigue. But beyond that, um, at this time, he's still having milder symptoms. But they are obviously watching him as he is definitely in the high risk category, being 79 years old. Our Washington, D.C. correspondent, Mary Bird, many thanks. Have a great weekend. Meanwhile, still in the United States, Texas is experiencing an unprecedented wildfire season and has seen the hottest temperature in the country so far this year. A heat advisory for southeast Texas warning of peak heat index temperatures ranging from 105 to 110 degrees Fahrenheit was put into effect Thursday by the National Weather Service's oh, Houston Galveston office. Nice the U.S. heat wave cool follows water. conditions in Europe this week that have touched off this wildfires and set record temperatures in the kind of Seems weather like events that scientists say will become more frequent with climate change. It feels nice and relaxing to get in the cool water. This heat is crazy. I've seen a lot of people pass out with this heat. The extreme heat, I mean, we kind of work together as a team, all communicating, making sure that we can bring enough water to all stay hydrated, um, taking care of each other, always checking on each other, making sure that we're good up there, you know, if we need anything, if we need an extra bottle of water while we're up there, um, just to stay hydrated. They believe it cools them down. I can tell you this water temperature is probably somewhere around uh, 90 degrees, uh, maybe a little bit warmer. Uh, what people don't realize is you actually sweat even in the swimming pool. So, but you don't realize that because you're wet and you're in the water and it's, it's an arm. So yes, uh, the perception is you're cooler, but the reality is you're probably not. And that's why as, a, as an operation, we take those 10 minute breaks, get people out of the water, out of the sun and into the shade. Global warming means global warming, and Texas temperatures on average are about two degrees Fahrenheit, warmer than they were in the 20th century, and that's consistent with the overall trends that we're seeing elsewhere. The uh, potential for extreme heat uh, essentially continues all the way into early September. Uh, because things just tend to keep drying out and the Gulf of Mexico tends to keep warming up. So, so those factors contribute to uh, uh, increased heat, uh, the sun getting farther down on the horizon from being nearly overhead. Uh, it works against that. Um, so uh, we have basically continued risk of extreme temperatures, 100 degree days, all the way out from here until at least early September, unless we get some widespread rains. Still ahead on the world today. UK Prince Harry wins bid to challenge security decisions. And in Europe, the European Union is predicting a tough year for wildfires and is in talks to buy firefighting planes. Thousands of firefighters across southern Europe this week are battling to contain hundreds of wildfires ranging from Portugal to France amid an intense heat wave that has caused hundreds of deaths. 
Islamic change has increased so-called fire weather heat waves and dry conditions that mean fires can spread faster and burn longer once ignited. More countries are requesting emergency help to tackle blazes. The EU has sent firefighting planes to countries including Portugal, France and Slovenia this month. It also stationed 200 firefighters from European countries in Greece to support local teams battling wildfires. The increase in calls for assistance with climate change fuel disasters like floods, fires and droughts has collided with the spike in resources needed to tackle other crises like the COVID-19 pandemic and the Ukraine war. No, 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 the frames, the frames, the frames. This summer will be really a serious challenge for us all, for the national authorities, as well as for us as coordinating the response. Last summer was bad already. And last summer we had nine activations of the Union Civil Protection Mechanism um, for forest fires. This year we already have had five and the height of the summer is still ahead of us. It all looks like this is the result of the climate change because the trends are unmistakable. While we may have here or there a, let's say, less bad year, the trends are unmistakable. We have an increased frequency and intensity of forest fires if we look over the average over the years. The European Union uh, is trying to procure the firefighting planes for this rescue. Uh, these planes will be technically uh, bought by the member states, but it, they will be 100% financed by the European Union. There are ongoing talks with the potential manufacturers, and uh, we expect that before long these planes will start coming off the production line. One of thousands of residents evacuated from El Hoyo do Pinares village in central Spain, Fernando Jimenez, has been speaking on his ordeal after wildfires came dangerously close to home. The 68-year-old wildfire evacuee sheds tears as he speaks about his hopes for the future. Emergency services battled wildfires across swaths of eastern and southern Europe amid mass evacuations on Wednesday in Spain, where emergency crews were fighting fires in five regions. National Weather Service also forecast higher temperatures. Kind of uh, emptiness, feel an emptiness inside. I um, tend to be uh, mm, positive, but uh, when I think of the on the on the on the mountains, the woods, lots and lots of mountains, lots of hundreds and thousands of trees. I think well, what's going to be left? <laughs> you know the place I grew up. I grew up with. Sorry. Don't know. Don't know what we're going to find. It's going to be just no trees, nothing. No, I don't know. Don't want to think about it. Sorry. Very tough for them. Moving to politics, Italians have been expressing their disillusionment and disappointment over the obtained crisis of Italian politics that brought the government led by Prime Minister Mario Draghi to collapse. Italy will hold a snap national election September 25 after Draghi resigned following the collapse of his national unity government, sending tremors through financial markets. It is likely to be a fractious campaign fought in the fierce summer heat in a drought-hit country. And Italians worried by the international situation and soaring prices of energy do not see the new scenario in favour. It will be the first autumn national election for more than a century in Italy, where the second half of the year is normally taken up with getting the budget law through Parliament. There is more on the side of Salvini and Berlusconi, and certainly Meloni has a strongly Eurocritical position, no doubt about that. Uh, but again, what are the possibilities for Italy to really move? 
uh, within the Atlantic community and within the European Union. I think that there is a national interest there and there is a country that is following a quite solid path, which is the path of Atlantic loyalty and is the path of cooperation with the other partners in the European Union. So I'm not saying that there are not going to be bumps there. I think there are going to be problems, there are going to be frictions, especially uh, with Europe, but I'm quite confident that any government must find a way to, co to cooperate with the other European partners, and I think that also a government uh, hegemonized by Meloni, if that happens, which of course is possible but is not sure, even that government will find a way to cooperate inside the European Union, because bottom line Italy does not have alternatives and they're going to learn how to cooperate inside the European Union. I, I don't believe that Russia played a role in this crisis and don't believe that the crisis happened on foreign policy and on the Russia Russian-Ukrainian conflict. I don't, I don't think that's the case. What entered in this, uh, in this game was mostly electoral considerations, electoral calculations. Away from Italy, the European Commission has launched four new legal procedures against Britain after the British Parliament's lower house cleared a bill to scrap some of the rules governing post-Brexit trading arrangements for Northern Ireland. The Commission, which oversees EU-UK relations, said Britain's unwillingness to engage in meaningful discussions on the protocol governing those trading arrangements and the House of Commons passage of the Northern Ireland Protocol um, Bill undermine a spirit of cooperation. Further, uh, infringements in the future. Thank you. Um, um, just to flag that in a spirit of constructive cooperation, we have refrained from launching new infringement procedures for over a year to create the space uh, to look for joint solutions with the UK. However, the UK unwillingness to engage in, in a meaningful manner um, in discussions uh, since last February and the continued passage of the Northern Ireland Bill uh, protocol through the UK Parliament uh, go directly against the spirit of cooperation I was mentioning. And uh, it is in this context that we have also launched the new infringements for non-compliance with significant parts of the protocol. This is not about us saying there is a problem with this part of the bill or a problem with that part of the bill. That's not the point. The point is we have an international agreement signed and ratified by both sides. There should be no UK bill currently going through Parliament. We are supposed to be implementing this protocol together. And that's why uh, we believe that the simple fact that a law has been introduced in order to unilaterally change the way the protocol works um, is inappropriate and is linked to the infringements that we have presented today. The port of Dover, Britain's main gateway to Europe, has declared a critical incident over long delays blaming French authorities for causing a bottleneck as holidaymakers look to start their summer breaks. Ferry operators warn passengers travelling to Calais that they face delays of up to four hours at the start of what is typically one of the busiest periods of travel The schools break up for their summer holiday. The port, which handles 12 million passengers, passengers each year, released a statement in which it also blamed French authorities for failing to properly staff border control posts based in Dover. The French border police have not responded, even as the British government says it is not their border police at fault. Britain's Prince Harry has won a bid to bring a high court challenge against the British Interior Ministry over his security arrangements. The high court judge has granted permission for part of Harry's claim for a judicial review of the decision. Prince Harry, who moved to the United States two years ago with his wife Meghan, is challenging a government decision for him to cease receiving police protection while in Britain, even if he covers the costs himself. The decision was made early 2020 by the executive committee for the protection of royalty and public figures on behalf of the Home Office, the UK ministry responsible for police, immigration and security. And that is 60 Minutes of the World today. Thank you for watching. I'm Minister Walker. Bye for now.